the Growth Happens Dawn to Dusk podcast with Matt Devitt. He talks with people about their journey, where they succeeded and failed to help others on their quest. We're all on a journey that starts and ends every day. This is when we grow between dawn and dusk. And now your host, Matt Devitt. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Growth Happens Dawn to Dust podcast. I am your host, Matt Devitt, for another fantastic episode with a good friend of mine and overall interesting guy. He's got a lot of facets, got his hands in a lot of different cookie jars. One Mr. Garrett Pear, and he and I connected in the lovely land of cement. As you guys are probably starting to realize, uh, I've met a lot of interesting people within that industry. I've definitely enjoyed my time there, but... Garrett's a fantastic guy. I really hope you guys get as many nuggets out of this as I did. He's got a great perspective on how to be a good mentor, but more importantly, how to really be a good mentee and find your mentor. He also talks a lot about action sports. So if you're interested in a guy who knows about motorcycles and motocross and that kind of aspect of action sports, definitely keep a listen. We talk a lot about that and the lessons that he learned there and how they apply into, you know, the business world that uh, he operates within now. So definitely look forward to a lot of good nuggets there. But before we get into it, if you like this show, definitely share. I appreciate all the comments and sharing of this show that's been going on thus far. Really helpful. Uh, The feedback is fantastic. So once again, you know, if you like it, give me a five star, give it a review Um, share it with somebody. If you find something in this that's of value, definitely push it out there. So without further ado, let's get on to our interview with Garrett Pear. So Garrett, welcome. Definitely appreciate you taking the time out today to come on my podcast, the Growth Happens Dawn to Dust podcast. Really looking forward to digging into what's been a pretty interesting, I guess, growth pattern, not only professionally, but the uh, the other items that you get yourself into. So, you know, thanks for being on the show. Absolutely, man. First of all, I I, I appreciate it. Um, This is my first, first podcast ever, which is super exciting because who knows what the, what's around the corner. Uh, But the fact is we've had a a great relationship in an industry that, um, you know, we were kind of an an anomaly and now here we are years later and we're not the, we're not the, the youngest guys on the block anymore. So no, it's been, it's been a fun ride, man. So thank you. Yeah, not a problem. And, you know, just to kind of help with that backstory um, and, you know, definitely uh, tell a little bit about yourself, but I mean, you know, so we're both, you know, kind of cement heads as they like to call us or, you know, guys that have worked either in or, uh, or around the cement industry for, for, for quite some time in different uh, capacities. So if you would, what's the, what's the nickel tour for everybody, you know, who, uh, who doesn't know who Garrett Perry is? Well, so I was born and raised in West Tennessee and made my way to Middle Tennessee to, to go to college at Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, I was in the engineering program there, but realized there was a lot of traffic uh, next door, which was a new program that had, that had become an actual degree in 2001, and it was the Bachelor of Science with Concrete Industry Management. Um, which was really interesting. So I saw the camaraderie over there and it got my attention. I went over there, uh, graduated there in 2005 and then ended up in Florida for a couple of years and then found myself back in middle Tennessee, but this time in Franklin, Tennessee, working for um, a Belgian company that lo and behold was a supplier in the cement industry. So that's where it kind of really took off in, in, in that realm and then in various companies in different capacities, I've still been in and around the cement industry. And that's when I met Matt, not only in the field, or when I met you, uh, not only in the field, but also out uh, in some of the conferences on the social aspect. And I was like, hey, this guy seems to be pretty like-minded. And here we are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And don't worry, I refer to myself in the third person every once in a while. So that happens. <laughs> good. Good. The, yeah. it's useful. Yeah. So, so the, the path that you kind of, you know, you took into this, it seems a little bit, um, you know, serendipitous. So I I guess we could start with, you know, kind of a more interesting question that I find, um, since you have been in the industry for a while, but you know, what are some of the big things that you think you have seen 
change within the industry overall that uh, kind of surprised you when looking back? Oh, I, I could tell you that from, from right now. First of all, I, I had heard about recessions, but I didn't know exactly, you know, I knew it was, had something to do with economics, uh, you know, when I, when I was younger. But when, when I joined the cement industry, I felt so far behind the ball because I had focused on the more construction and, and, and end user component coming into the industry and working with extremely bright and intelligent people um, and knowing that I was behind the ball, and, I, and, and but I had a huge opportunity, um, I really doubled down on the technical aspects of the products, uh, the products that we were manufacturing, the products that we were supplying, uh, and just I felt that if I would be on the road and be the most technical person available and just be extremely accessible at all times uh, that I would be, you know, more than successful. And then the recession hit us. And not only did people that I know in the industry that had had, you know, 20 and 30 year tenures, not only were all of their contacts disappearing, but there was also a shift in the industry that went from I don't want to say cash heavy, but focusing on the technical best best solution to more of a commercial. Uh, let's go with the cheapest price. Let's let's leverage the suppliers against one another, kind of like the the auto industry. And and you know, so yeah, it went from from technical to commercial. So once I tried to understand that, and once I tried to understand different industries outside of cement that have experienced this, that's what led me to back to grad school. And to go to business school, um, just to say, okay, well, maybe if I have this technical component and then I have the commercial component, then maybe I can hold a better conversation because during a recession, focusing, you know, during a recession as a premium supplier, I don't care what industry you're in, was a, a rough road. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's interesting. So from, from your perspective, it wasn't so much a change um, per se within the industry, it was the kind of the capitalistic environment which the industry was working within is the massive change that you saw you know i mean this you're talking you know the 08 09 you know time frame yeah. so pre that versus post that are we still in that post um kind of lowest cost provider or do you see people starting to come back around to wanting more of a tailored you know, um product or or sub, or even just just general service support I, I think it's a split. I think it's I think it's a split. I think that they're both there. You know, you have people operationally that are that are kind of over. Um, you, you have. I think I think they're both there. To be honest with you, I don't think it'll ever be the way that it was. Or I'm also going to be honest to say it may not have ever been that way. That was just my perception. And fair. Um, you know, with with where we're at today, you can definitely provide. It's really understanding where you are in the value chain, and if you can understand where you're at and and if you're just a product supplier or if you're a product and service supplier you know it's it's understanding where you're at in the value chain and and what you can provide you know what i mean and so i think it's i think it's better but there's still i mean price is still important and mm -hmm. and i think that i'm going to definitely double down on, on value instead of price and if um I know my costs and I know where I'm at. I'm 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 going to be, you know, as open and transparent as possible. And that'll always be taken advantage of, but the people that value that, I think will 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 be that that's the direction to go. You know what I mean? Right. Just to be as consistent as possible. So, as far as the industry's concerned or the industry that we're both part of, hey, I'm I'm optimistic. I'm I'm extremely optimistic cuz that's just the only way I can be, Matt. You know what I mean? say, it's just who you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the value portion that you've brought up a couple of times, I think, is um, something definitely worth noodling on a little bit. So is that? I mean, it's it, it sounds like the value portion you've gotten from hands on experience. You know, seeing that a a, um, a good product. You know, the idea of value to give to the customer, but was that reinforced in some of the, cause you talked about schooling and getting the technical side and then going back for more of the commercial business side. Um, do you think more of a focus on value came out of those educational things or is it really just 
boots on the ground talking to customers. Well, even, well, even my path to school, I'm going to be honest with you, I spent five years uh, prior to going back to school trying to talk myself out of going to school because it was a big investment. And, you know, I was reading, you know, books like my personal MBA. I was reading, you know, you know MBA books, what they don't teach you in Harvard Business School. I mean, I'm reading tons of books. I'm, I'm, I'm diving in head first into finance and marketing and you know, I mean, ethics is now a big component as a result of Enron. <laughs> but right. I mean, the I think that you know gets you take, studying for a test that was you know adaptive, like a, uh, the, the GMAT that I did horrible at, and then it got better and better and better. And then I went to one school, and then after getting accepted there, I realized, hey, you know what, this is a business too. <laughs> so. Uh, I knew that I was only going to get out of this what I put into it. And, you know, someone always used to tell me, or people used to always tell me, man, don't do this for the credential, do this uh, for what you want to get out of it. And honestly, I was like, I'm totally doing this for the credential. <laughs> and and then but once I got deep down into it, I found what I wanted to get out of it. And, and it was, you know, more than just the, the, the knowledge and the book knowledge. And I wanted to marry that. There was a 10 year gap from when I got out of school to when I went back to business school. So I just think I'm a value guy, you know, across the board anyway, it doesn't matter if you're going to the lake, you know, boating is not cheap. And if you go cheap to try to save costs, you know, I learned buy nice or buy twice, you know, when it comes to boating, uh, same thing when you're riding motorcycles, same thing. If you, if you can wait longer and, and buy something of value, and, and uh, I mean, I don't know. I just, that's, that's my viewpoint. It's been my experience. I've never been one of those guys, I guess, because I'm so open to get good deals on things or to haggle very much. But you know what? I know so many people that are super successful in doing that. Um, I just, it's just not, my personality is, is based on value and I'm willing to pay for value and I appreciate value. So that, that's kind of, a personal, a personal thing. Gotcha. So your personal view on, I guess the the transactions that you like to be a part of or or take place, definitely put a bigger emphasis on value. And that's kind of interesting because there was a quote, and I cannot remember the somebody will probably leave this in the comments, but the uh, the person who started up Patagonia, and he had a phrase that went along the lines of, um, "Poor people can't afford to buy cheap gear." And it was, right. you know, it was, it was, it was interesting yeah. because, you know, the, as I read through the article, it really went into kind of what you're talking about is like, you know, you can buy something cheap, but if you have to buy, and his example was if you have to buy a new winter jacket every year, it was like, why wouldn't you just spend twice as much and have the same winter jacket for the next 10? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I have friends, for example, that could pull a single axle trailer with 10 year old tires on it from Tennessee to California and back and not have a single issue. Um, you know, but before I leave, I'm going to have a double axle trailer with two spare tires and new tires on it. Cause, cause if I choose to gamble, it, it, it's, it seems like it, it happens at the most inopportune time. And I think that's just how it goes. You know, I mean, I, again, going back to, my upbringing racing motocross and you know a, a passion of you know, jumping 100 foot you know or, or more jumps and doubles the thing is i'm not trying to save money on a uh, on a part that goes inside that engine you know i'm trying to make sure i got the best the best you know component that i can get for them regardless of the cost because uh you know, I've hit the ground a lot too, and it sucks. So I'm trying to minimize that problem. It's all about probability distribution. <laughs> you know what I mean? I try to make yep. sure that doesn't happen as frequently as it did uh, being younger and broke. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and it's uh, so some of the uh, the items that you've alluded to or, or spoke to, I was going to wait a little bit, but we might as well dig into it now. So you're a huge fan of action sports. I mean, there's, yeah, there's you know, I mean, within I think the first. 30, I'll, get, I'll say minutes, but it could have been 30 seconds that you and I started talking to each other. I mean, I think we got right into talking about, you know, bikes and things like that. And again, that's not really my realm. I think it's really right, awesome. Right. You know, I, I enjoy it, um, but it's definitely not my realm. So, uh, so action sports, how did that happen? I mean, were you one of those kids at the age of, you know, three that you see on one of those little, you know, 50cc, you know, 20cc motorcycles? 
No, I wanted to be. I wanted to be big time. I, we we were building a house. Uh, my dad was building a house in 1988, and we were in a rental house. And the guy across the street, you know, it was it was late 80s. He was like, on, he had a dirt bike. He wasn't there all the time, and he built a little ramp, like just a single pile of dirt in the yard. And he used to, I used to hear it, you know, hear the motorcycle, and I would just stand there in the window and watch him jump. And then I don't know if he, I don't think he was there all the time. But when he wasn't there, you know, he just had the bike leaned up against the side of the house. And sometimes I would venture across the street, which was huge, you know, and and just stare at the bike. And there's this weird, you know, I've talked to musicians. You know, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. So I've talked to guys that have this same passion about guitars or playing the drums or guys that work on their own cars. You know, it's like there's, I don't know, man, the, the, the motocross world and supercross kind of, kind of, reached out and grabbed me man because also something that was interesting was the races only came on tv you know every once in a while when they did it happened at two or three o'clock in the morning so uh learned how to set the vcr and, and record all night and just sit there and fast forward until i found them you know and then that is what i don't know it got me and it was funny because my, my mom always thought it was going to go away but it never did and then here we are you know years later and it's been in that that sport you know, led me to, you know, snowboard, snowboarding. And then of course that led me to, to wakeboarding, which was easier to do in, in Tennessee, not much snowboarding happening here. <laughs> right. Um, and then, um, I guess back in the late nineties when like, you know, Hanson's energy drink came out, it was brought to the table, um, in the, in the freestyle world. So I got to see the birth of freestyle motocross. I got to see the birth of the, the energy drink realm that is Red Bull and monster and all these things that have just unfolded in, in front of me during before before it existed. And uh, so I thought that was cool, man. I wanted to be a part of it in any way I could. I wanted to volunteer. I wanted to, where do these people meet? How can I be around them? And yeah, man, that was, that was a huge focus up until, until I realized that, that now that I'm working, hey, man, I need to, I need to, I need to buckle down here as well because um, the shelf life on action sports is, is not much past 30. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Right, right, right. I mean, so did you do any, did you do any competition? I mean, I, mean, I mean no disrespect to, to anyone that, that has made it past 30. i got to give Chad Reed props. Uh, he's 36 or 37, and he's, he's still racing at a very, very high level. But, yeah, I mean, I, raced, I was just, you know, your local pro guy. I mean, I never – I never – was out there, you know, it's so interesting once you, once you become the, the fast local guy, you know what I mean? And then you, you go a hundred miles away. It's a whole nother, a whole nother mm -hmm. realm. And then once you, once you step up that world and then once you become, you know, a professional, for example, you realize you went from the top to the bottom of the barrel. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it was funny that the struggle during all the years of racing, uh, my dad also was really trying to push golf. And I'm glad that I had the golf experiences that I've had. But what was funny was, I mean, I didn't care. This is what I wanted to do. And then dad would show me, you know, the earnings of of someone racing, you know, at the capacity I was versus someone playing golf. And then he would right. show me the longevity. And he would show me things like the senior PGA when there wasn't a senior, you know, AMA Supercross mm -hmm. class, you know. Right. Uh, so it was, so yeah, like it, it was, you know, they, they held me back from, really chasing the dream and yeah there was some resentment there at certain times but at the end of the day man look i'm i'm very happy how things have turned out and i'm happy to continue to still uh participate not only in the sport around the sport and still get to throw my leg over a bike from time to time but it's yeah it's kind of the thirty thousand foot view when you're getting into um so do you call it, you know, what do you, what do you call it? Supercross motor? What's the, the name for Supercross? This? Supercross is indoor and motocross okay. is, is outdoor. So mainly motocross. Okay. So, so when you were doing motocross at the time, did you see habits that you were picking up or building there that have really paid dividends for you, you know, later in life or even now? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question because this is something that, um, that I've, that I've talked about with different people on different levels, not only in sports, but also in business. For example, 
um, I was always wanting people to tell me what to do and how to do it. Like if I got around somebody that was better than me or faster than me, I'd be like, Hey, you know, what, what are you doing here? You know, in this corner, what are you, what are you, are you, you know, clicking from second gear to third gear? Are you half throttle, three quarters of throttle? What are you doing? And I, and I noticed a trend that no one could tell me what to do. No one could tell me how to do it specifically. And, and I found that odd because, you know, I feel like, what I expected for someone to be better than me, they could tell me exactly how to do it to help, you know, Hey, I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. So, you know, what, what do I need to do? And, and, uh, yeah, I, I never was able to find that because I guess you can't be told what to do. You've got to, you know, figure it out yourself in, in a certain way. Um, but I dissect things to such a detailed level. And so I go so deep and I can go so far out in the weeds and even people that listen to this podcast may feel as though that's already happened at some point. (laughs) Uh, But that's because I'm trying to understand every aspect. I'm trying to understand things I don't understand. And it's not like taking things apart and put it back together. It's like, I'm trying to make sure that, you know, my entry speed is, is, is correct. I want to make sure my timing is correct. I want to make sure that I've done all the work leading up into this point that I can pull it off. And then I want to know that, you know, as I exit this corner or as I land from this jump, it may not go the way I expected it to. And to be flexible enough to handle the the consequences or uh, don't get too excited. Don't celebrate too early because there's another one coming and, you know, celebrate the moment while you can be as present as possible. Realize that, you know, not only, is is human nature going to take over at some point, but also have a DNA code that has things that are uncontrollable that I can only be aware of, and there's only so much you can influence. But again, that was a mouthful, but that's how um, being in motocross, you know, from, from, from the get-go was not only was it just tons of fun, and, and even when you crashed or you broke a collarbone or you broke a leg, like you forget about that. You forget about it, and you, and you just want to get back out there, and you want to be better. And, and um, I think it's it, even even the struggle with with not having the support that I wanted, man. Like the you know the the self awareness was, man. It's it's that's why I love action sports because nothing can creep into your head in that moment except for what you're doing. It doesn't even matter if you're, you know, in a field playing around or if you're at the top level. I mean, you're you're hyper focused and that was something that was always hard for me to do. Yeah, that makes that's those are some interesting items that you pulled out of there with regards to you know being flexible as you talked about, you know, landing the jump and stuff like that. I mean, I can definitely see that being very applicable to just business or life <laughs> in general. I mean, the you know, as, yeah. as Mike Tyson has said, you know, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And so <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, those are those are definitely some things that I could definitely see how being in a sport like that where my perception is, you know, the risk is considerably higher than somebody, you know, the same age playing basketball, so to say, or, or soccer, maybe not totally, but, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm being generalized here. Um, but it also seems like the reward is much larger. So even though they may balance each other, if you were looking at them as some kind of ratio, they may look the same between all three of those. The uh, the highs and lows within your sport were probably much larger or much farther apart. There was a bigger delta in those. Do you think that helped kind of solidify the the habits? Because you very quickly figured out like, oh, that's not good because the again the extreme was so extreme, and oh, this was really good. I need to keep doing that. Do you, do you think it helped reinforce those things much faster than other activities? Yeah, I did. It, absolutely. Well, well, the the good news is, is I had the opportunity to play all kinds of sports. You know, from from all the team sports plus plus golf. And uh, one thing I look back on that that I realized that it was happening at a very young age. And even even my daughter at 20 months, I can I can't wait to. She, she's a lot like me based on what I see. And I know that can change. And I know that parents that may listen are like, dude, you don't even know what's, what's happening, but, but, uh, <laughs> or, or what you're in, what you're in store for. But, but I, no one put more pressure on myself than me, even at a young age and nothing, you know, there was a lot of lessons I learned, like in golf, like if my dad was following me on an 18 hole, you know, golf tournament, 
you know, I would look over at his body language. I would, I would, that was so much pressure that I had put on myself. I put so much, I, I didn't do that really in team sports because I cared about the, the camaraderie and, and having good relationships with people and working as a unit. Uh, but in, in motocross or in, in a, a sport where you're there, um, one of the biggest things I learned early was like preparation was so key. And any time I would uh, be like, "Dude, you're you're the you're the freaking man," and this is just my personality type, because there's so many people out there that that have a killer instinct and go after it, and I think they they are successful, but I also think they have a whole other level of of challenges that may not be addressed in the public. But for me, um, I wanted to under promise and over deliver, and but the times that that I would get. Uh, arrogant or conceited about what what was about to happen you know that would be it would never go the way I wanted it to go and then on the flip side of that if I was pulling in the parking lot going oh well he's here okay well I may have second place oh crap he's here I'm going to get third place like there was this huge sometimes I would be too arrogant other times I would be too insecure and really being okay with both of those and trying to find okay what what needs to happen here to, to to get rid of both of those and the answer to that was work and and to to really put in the work and really show up and really not even care about the people in the parking lot or care about the perception that people had you know what i mean of of me or my narrative my internal narrative needed to be under under control and this is what i've been trying to dial in for the past few years when, and this is actually somewhat more of a business question, the way it's going to sound, but it actually applies to the motocross, action sports, so on and so forth. But as you've went through, so you brought up your dad a couple of times with golf. Um, I'm assuming you had coaches in there and stuff like that. But have yeah. you found over the years qualities that worked well in either that, you know, coach player relationship? And this is where it, is it will sound more business is more of that mentor mentee relationship have you found some things that like okay this is going to click for us or mm, it, it'll work but it's not as good as it could be yeah no doubt um so in in that regard what up the 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 number one thing i've seen from my dad since day one is is, is hard work i mean he'll, he'll i mean he was you know people talk about well when you have kids then you you know you lose your hobbies you lose all the things because you sacrificed that for them. Well, uh, my dad, the only thing he sacrificed was sleep because he did not sleep. He worked around the clock and he was, he was torn between days and nights. And, and uh, I don't think, I don't, I can't tell you when he slept, you know, K through 12 for me, you know, I don't know. Uh, so the hard work was, was drilled into me at a young age and, um, uh, there, I mean, I can I can give you a million, a million. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about all the hard work from 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 his perspective, which is kind of mind blowing. Uh, but I think from a coaching perspective, and even some of the mentors that I have, one thing I noticed with the the mentors I have now, I have some that are similar to me. I have others that are even introverted that 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 are completely different than me. So I'm really trying to listen more and. and one thing I was doing was trying to tell my story, trying to tell my perception, trying to get people to understand. So if they didn't understand, I would talk more, talk louder, use a different example. And not only does that not work with people, it doesn't work with my wife. <laughs> it doesn't work, you know, with, you know, as a student. So with my coaches, I got, you know, the hard work component from my dad, but then, you know, some of the best coaches I've had really get to know me who I am, what was, how they were going to make me move. How was their message going to be received? How would I take that message and utilize it? So like I'm talking Jedi mind tricks type stuff. You know what I mean? That, that we're like, Whoa, I didn't realize this is why he was doing that. And this was going to be the outcome. So, you know, based on, 
me helping other people, whether they're younger or in business or in sports, I try to take an approach that's not even on the radar. You know what I mean? Like if I have guys that are riding that, that want some help, you know, I'll listen to them and I'm like, dang, this is like, this is like me, right? He's telling me, he's giving me all the excuses and all the reasons why he can't do a certain thing. And then my response to whatever we're working on is going to be something that wasn't even on his radar to begin with. And then try to get him to focus on that and see if we can, you know, start to build some momentum from there. Um, same thing in the business world. You know, I think nowadays uh, where the balance is off, right, because I had a change of work, I had a, a child, you know, my, my physical health, you know, it's pretty good from the outside looking in, but it, it definitely suffered. It's like trying to focus on um, – I don't want to say like the past, you know, it, it just being unconventional, man, unconventional. And, and I don't know. I, I, it's hard to put into words. It's like trying to tell someone how to swim, right? It's really difficult to do. You, mm-hmm. you can, you can't take a kid and put them on the side of the pool and say, all right, man, so this is what you got to do. You move your arms, you cup your hands and you kick your feet and you're good. Well, you know, it, it's, it's extremely difficult. That's why I think that, in the past when I was expecting people to say, listen, man, just get your weight up on the front seat, you know, put weight on the outside pegs. Don't look directly in front of you and hammer down. That could be great advice to somebody, but it wasn't enough information for me. I needed more information in order to to do it. And then I had to figure it out on my own, but it's really a tailored approach, but really finding that person that has the capability, finding that person that has the drive, finding the person that's, going to be okay with not knowing everything you know i don't know i, I, hope, I hope i didn't go way off subject there but, but it's, it's a <laughs> it go wherever question. you want it to i mean to me it sounds like what you're looking for is you know um, so it almost sounds like uh, you're you're putting the classification in two different categories like for you coaches are those that are the tactical i'm going to help you in one area and so you know hard work time under tension reps you know, things like that within an area, they're going to oversee that to at least make sure you're going in the right direction. But it also sounds like with mentors, maybe this is more now in the business realm or, or just um, semantics with the word, but it sounds like you're also looking for people to illuminate those blind spots because then maybe that's where you can get that information that, you know, you weren't getting from one person, but it's enough to fill in that picture for you. Right. And it's hard to check all the boxes, like back to the coaching component. Yeah, they can it can dive down into the, you know, the tactical, you know, you should do this, this, and this. And, uh, but you need to have some type of connection to where they know your next step. They know your next word. They know where you're at. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and your values need to be in line. You know, your values need to be in line. The, the, you need someone like, let's go to the, let's go to the psychological component. I, I think the psychological component this day and age you know, is, is, is even, I mean, first of all, you, anybody that's going to work hard, and there's plenty of people working hard out there. I mean, look at CrossFit, you know, it's taking right. normal people to the next, to the next level. And then, you know, when you're like, oh, that's not bad. It's an eight minute workout. And then you're like, okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I thought I was, I thought I was an athlete. I thought I was in shape, you know, so there's, there's the physical side, I think is, is extremely difficult. But for me, again, since childhood, having hard work drilled into my head. When I would get to the to the end of the rope, my dad would be like, man, you're not even at 50% capacity. Keep going. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. that, was, that was huge. But then again, also, I was in a position at work in a certain area where I had outworked any and everybody based on my perception. Could be wrong. But I had worked and was willing to do anything and everything, but it just didn't line up timing-wise. And, you know, what what people – would say could be politics. It's a real thing, right? Uh, but but I was I can't blame it on that. It was just mm-hmm. a timing issue. So um, that cycle, that 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 internal narrative is it's important to get a grasp on that because I don't think you'll ever get a full grasp of it, right? I think it's always going to be there. I don't know when it when it you just got to be able to manage it, right? And and when really valuable coaches for me would say these things, would say the things that, that I think I was like, whoa, that made the connection strong. When, when someone would verbalize, okay, so 
we already talked about the fact that I was having issues when I was younger and I didn't understand why people couldn't just tell me what to do. Like, you're better than me at this. Why can't you tell me how to do it? Right. Right. Um, going back to the fact that I would have these, you know, I'd read you know, tons of books, listen to, you know, hundreds of podcasts, you know, I'm, I'm rock and rolling. And then when I would be around somebody, they would say something out loud that, that, that made me know that they were not only so confident that they've had, some type of experience that's given them like that's what really interested me. That's what really I was like, whoa, this is this guy's on it. You know what I mean? That's what gets my attention because this is something I didn't know. Right. So that's why I go there. That's why some people that I meet with in, in business, why some people that I meet with personally were like, God, he told me too much. He told me everything. Like I would dominate this guy in poker. Of course you would. Right. You know what I mean? Because you know, I'm I'm trying to extract that value. I'm trying to create the value, and I'm confident that that I'm not too far off the right direction for 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 my path. You know what I mean? Right. Within the so, let's take a look at the other side of this, and that would be like the player or the mentee. What are certain things that either you saw yourself do, or maybe you know view it as? Because I'm sure you've coached people and mentored people. Um, what have you seen that player or that mentee do to where you knew they were, they were kind of adding value to the relationship, you know, cause the concern I have sometimes is, is that people are always looking for a mentor, but they really don't know how to make the relationship work. They assume they're going to find a mentor, suck a bunch of information out of them. And then that person's going to be yeah. okay with that. Um, well, this so what have great. you seen people do cool. that add value to the, you know, to the coach or to the to mentor? Well, let me tell you about finding that mentor because Please. this is something that that my that my wife would would chime in on this. Okay, so when I you know when I was looking for these mentors, or when I'm listening to a podcast, or when I'm reading a book, and I realized that 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 I needed somebody in my life, I needed some somebody to help me with these things. Well, your life is made up of different seasons. You know what I mean? And we're, you and I are in a different, an interesting one right now, right? Where we've had changes at work. We have our, our children are about the same age. You know, we've been married about the same period of time. Like it's yep. just that we're at a, an interesting season of our life. Well, uh, years ago when, when I realized that, you know, I wasn't going to be the next Jeremy McGrath or Ricky Carmichael or, you know, Chad Reed, I was <laughs> just kidding. I mean, that, that's high hopes, right? That was in my Ooh. dreams. I wanted, to, I wanted to be, I wanted to be like that. Uh, but I, I was just a regular dude, you know, that that came from, you know, a family that was doing everything that they could to make my life better. Therefore, I go to school, and then I come out of school, and then I go to work, and I'm following, I'm, I'm doing all the right steps for that period of time. Obviously, that time has changed now, where you have. You know, people still going down the traditional path. You've got other people that, you know, uh, you know, look at look at corporate America different than we did, right? Mm -hmm. Or look at uh, work completely different. But the fact is, man, I tried to force it, meaning finding a mentor. You know, I would listen to a podcast or I would listen, read a book, and I'd be like, all right, cool. I know just the person or this is the direction I'm going to go. Well, let's take it even deeper when I experienced the layoff and I'll never forget going to visit a friend. This was after the recession that had just gotten laid off. And what was funny is I was driving home and in my head, I never said this out loud, but in my, my head, I said, man, I'm glad that'll never happen to me. I worked way too hard for that to happen to me. And lo and behold, several months later, I get a knock on my door and, and, you know, my computer, my iPad, my phone. So I got I got to sit on the couch for eight hours going, wow, I can't even get a hold of my wife until it would just happen, right? During that time, I realized that, okay, I was standing in my garage going, man, I got a bunch of stuff to sell because this money is definitely going to go out faster than it was coming in. But then I realized also when I was looking at, you know, traditional ways, whether it be, you know, trying to get your resume out there, whatever, I was like, hold on. I have a network. I have a network of people. And this is, this is what I'm, this is going to be the most valuable use of time right now. Is, is, and I still have that calendar uh, that, that I can go and look at all the times I had coffee with people, how I had lunch with people, 
how I had dinners with people, how I, you know, flew to a different state to say I was in the area to let someone know, hey, man, I'm in the area. You know, you might have to swing by and we have lunch or something. They're like, yeah. Well, they didn't even know that I flew down there for them. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have flown from Tennessee to California to say, man, I am literally in the neighborhood for work and was just wanting to connect. You know, you got a few minutes. And they're like, yeah. And again, success because I was not out there for work. I just used points to fly out there and say that. You know what I mean? Right. And and that's just it. So where I'm going with this is you're going to strike out so many times. I mean, and people that, that, that have jobs where they cold call or, or they've got to, you know, get recommendations from other friends and stuff, like as annoying as I had thought that was, that's just how I felt in certain times, those people are learning a pretty valuable skill set of just, you know, brute force, just continue to plow through things because it'll work. And I think that's, in my opinion, what or, you know, what I see with, with people in the music industry almost anything across the board, man, you just got to keep going. You, you know, when you, once you get to that worst and most painful point in time, you've just got to continue going in the direction that you're going and, and have confidence and, and not think that everything is cliche, just keep, keep going. And, and, uh, so when I was reaching out, there's so many people, um, that, that I thought would be like the best mentor that they could, give me the best advice for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe it was because of their net worth. Maybe it was because of, 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 you know, what I thought of them or what position they were in or what company they were with. And, and I, and I've made a lot of wrong decisions, man. Like, I, I, you know, I would get, I would get close to somebody that I, that I had thought I knew who they were. I thought how this was going to work out and it didn't work out that way. Matter of fact, there's, there's people that I've done that with that we don't even, we never have communicated since. You know what I mean? I don't know if I did something. I don't know if they just weren't into it. I don't know. But what did happen was I did make contact with someone and, and that, that not only understood but gave me their time, you know, because that's the most valuable asset that I wasn't realizing when I was trying to fo- force these things. And then, you know, now I'm happy to say I have about four different – four to five, you know, mentors that I could call at any given moment at any given time. And they're all in different industries doing different things. And, and if they don't answer the phone, they'll call me back or text me back, you know, soon. Because I was respectful of the time. I had gone through a lot of situations where people that are, it, it just wasn't working out the way I thought it was going to work out. But once I realized you just got to keep going and you've got to keep, you can't leave any stone unturned, not to sound cliche. You just got to say, listen, I like this person. I respect this person. I'm trying to do everything I can to extract the knowledge. And I don't want to do all the talking. I want to listen. And and then once that contact is made, you yourself have to be so intentional about building that relationship and be so intentional of, of you know, not getting lazy. Like, don't let it fizzle out. You know what I mean? Because it started good, keep going. And, and of course, during this entire process, I'm changing as well, right? So it's really interesting. I, I hope that makes sense as far as don't give up on, on people or get – because all the people I thought would help me when I was laid off, I thought, oh, this person will help me. This person will have all the answers. That that, that They didn't. And, and it's an uncomfortable thing. I mean, even if I had a buddy call me now that's like, hey, man, I'm I'm kind of panicking right now. I need all your, you know, all the help you can give me. They put all that pressure on me. I'm just like, man, dude, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, there's no doubt you're going to come out of this process better than you are. You, and you probably don't want to hear that right now and you don't know it, but that's truly what's going to happen. Keep, keep doing your thing. So does that make sense regarding the, regarding the mentors? You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not easy and no one can tell you how to do it. You just can't give up. Yeah. I think it's the, so the way I interpreted the, the explanation that you went through is, you know, you, it's almost, um, don't pick the person, but pick the attributes you're looking for. Because if you pick the person and they say no, well, then that's going to hurt. But if you pick attributes that to me, um, opens you up to more opportunities of, you know, Hey, if I'm looking for good organizational skills, that's the attribute. Um, you know, it would be easier to potentially find somebody to help you with that than Martha Stewart, right? So it, it sounds to me like the way you ended up working about this is like, okay, what skill sets do I need? 
who has that? And then let's just start talking to people and see who's in a good place. Cause you never know. I mean, they have to be in a window where they're looking to help somebody, not just, yeah. um, that, that's, and on another level, like for example, someone that, that, that I looked up to, I thought they were awesome. And, and, and I came out and this was the only time I ever came out and said, man, I really need a mentor. Would you please like, you know, you know, help me in certain scenarios. And the only time I ever said that out loud to somebody, right. That, that of course they didn't say no, you know, they said, sure. And then we, I mean, we still talk today, but not really much about business because mm -hmm. You know, like I could never get a hold of this guy, you know, and then I would build up resentment and be like, dude, I thought he was going to help me. I thought he was going to help me through this situation. I thought he was going to help me. So no, no fault of his own. Like, right. He's got his own life, his own set of circumstances. Where, where I was really going is, is that the people that could be your best mentor may already be in your life. They may not be. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, and if you see something interesting, then be intentional about it, but don't be, you know, be intentional about building that relationship and relationships are not built overnight and they're not built in three weeks. They're not built in two months. So you've got to be consistent, but you've also got to add so much value to them to where it's worthwhile, right? You can't just always be like, Hey man, I need to talk about me. I need to talk about, I need you to help me with, it's like, listen, can I do anything for you, you know, to get the time with this person, right? Is, is kind of where I was going with it. It's, it's a, it's a bumpy road. It's not as black and white as you think it's going to be, but it, man, is it important? Yeah. And the, and the description that you're putting there towards the end um, leads into the idea that the best thing a mentee can do in that relationship, or even a player is understand that time is being spent. I mean, both of you are there literally spending time. Um, but the coach has a skill set like they don't they don't have to. I mean, even though there's a, you know, the saying those who can do those who can't coach. And I don't completely believe that the older I get. But as long as the player and the mentee, you know, realize, OK, I'm getting a resource from this person that, you know, they cannot make more of. So how do I make them want to direct that resource to me? And that gets to your point of, you know, always making sure you're creating, you know, more value. Um, you know, to the mentor or the coach than what they might be putting out at that time. And, th and this is always over the long run, right? I mean, because there's going to be times where you go to a coach and you're like, dude, my swing is terrible. Like, can you just help me with this? Um, but then the other times you can be a great player by just when your coach pulls you out or tells you to go play a position that you're not used to, you just go do it. You know, you just, you, you just, you do it, you know, you, you figure it out and you make it happen and you try to, you know, deliver um, so those are, that's just kind of the, what I took from what you were talking about. I think it's all extremely relevant. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's interesting. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, they're personal relationships. Um, so they're always interesting. They're always very dynamic. They're not static items. And like you said, you know, the person you start that, that relationship with, you know, in you know, any time span, when you look into the future or you look back, um, hopefully if it goes well, you're not the same person. Right. And so that's yeah, always going to sure. impact that, uh, that relationship and neither are they. And, and back to the, the moto thing, it's like, you know, one, one thing I didn't realize until later in life, how to handle was when it doesn't go as you expect, you know what I mean? When something fizzles out or when something happens, like, you know, I got, I got to be honest. You just got to don't be so hard on yourself. Give yourself, extend a little grace to the person and yourself to realize, Hey man, it's just, it's things are shifting, you know, like be, mm -hmm. be, be okay with whatever direction it goes. If it benefits you, if it doesn't, you know, be gritty enough to move past if it's not in your benefit. If it isn't your benefit, be humble because you know, it's, it's only it's temporary. Everything's temporary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This shall pass as they say. So with <laughs> you being an extremely, um, a person that has a lot on their plate on the table, you know, trying to balance family, your hobbies, work. How do you keep yourself in a realm of being productive and not falling uh -huh. into the busy trap? Good question, man, because I've been so knee deep into the busy trap. Uh, geez, man. I mean, you know, it's, I think the busy trap is a, is a state of mind, man. As, as weird as that is, because this is funny. I've asked I've asked one of my mentors the same question. A guy that was, you know, uh, 
he was top dog of two CEO, you know, publicly traded companies at, at, at the same time. So <laughs> I was like, if I if he can do this, if he can do that, then I can do what I'm doing, right? And another close friend of mine who's a musician who went from, uh, you know, the what what some people think of success overnight, which is never the case, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I asked him the same question, man. You've got so many people that are dependent on you now. You know, how do you keep it together? You know, because you're sitting here right now eating lunch with me. How do you keep this together? And I've been able to ask these questions to people that I know that are, 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 that are so far beyond where I'm at in this moment. But really, uh, I'm, uh, you know, when it came down to goal setting and, and all these things that are so key and, and people to do and writing things down, um, I really, my most recent shift was just getting the people component. Like I, I focused on people, you know, the, the people component of work, sales, profit, you know, I pick, just handpicked a few things. And what makes most sense in my life is my marriage. I don't want the opportunity that I, that's been given me that, that is work or that is my new position, that is my new role. I want to get the people right there. And then at home, I want to make sure that my wife doesn't want to shoot me. Um, and I want to make sure that I don't miss my, my daughter's, you know, first two years of life. You know what I mean? Like these are the priorities. And, um, it's okay to be out of balance, right? A lot of people talk about this balance. The balance is key. I believe, I, like, I believe in it, right? The, your physical health, your personal health, your spiritual health, and then your professional health. Like, I, I believe in it 100%. But it's okay to be out of balance. And I think that's the thing that's helped me the most is giving myself permission to not get it right. <laughs> um, it's okay that, that, you know, I may be gone for a certain period of days and then I get home and I expect my, my wife's going to be excited because I'm home. She's going to roll out the red carpet and my daughter is going to be so pumped. And there's been so many times that has been the case, but there's been other times where that's totally not the case and it's okay. Um, it's totally okay. And, and you're not going to get it right. Um, but really prioritizing. So specifically, when I stepped into my new role last October, I knew that coming into the 2019, I kind of set things in motion. What I wanted to get accomplished in the first 10 weeks, what I wanted to accomplish past that. And I had these professional uh, milestones that I wanted to try to hit or work towards. And as long as I'm moving forward, I'm fine. Um, and then you know, with the family, as long as I can be more present than ever in certain scenarios. And I don't get that right all the time either. That's probably one of my biggest challenges. Uh, as long as I know I'm moving toward being better, then I'm good. Because the, I have no balance right now. And every time I start to go in my own pit of despair, I think back to that conversation that I had with the musician. And then I also think back to the conversation I had with my mentor that was running two companies. It was like, you cannot let your physical health go backwards you can't and uh for multiple reasons for your own sanity for your daughter and then when i realized that the the musician told me look don't take yourself too seriously you've got more work to do you've got things to move forward don't get beat up so it's it's uh i hope that i hope that answers the question just being oh just giving myself permission to screw up realizing that that i'm not going to be able to uh to keep it together but as long as I know I'm moving forward, specifically with with uh, bullet point items that, that I know that I'm, I'm working on. And, that I, and, and the cool thing is once I get to that 10 weeks and I look back, I'm like, wow, everything that I wrote down, everything that I put on paper is either in progress or it happened. Mm-hmm. And other things are moving on beyond that. So that's that's a big thing with me is just being being intentional about knowing what direction I'm going in. Because anytime it's okay to have a day where you're like, okay, what just happened that day? It's okay. That's going to happen. But in the past, I would be like, that's unacceptable. You've got to be more disciplined. You've got to work harder. You've got to, you know, but, but man, at the end of the day, dude, there's, there's 24 hours in a day. And if you're going hard for, you know, weeks at a time, I've never learned in the past. I would, I would argue that no one, that you don't have a limited capacity. Uh, but I, you do. 
Yeah, that makes complete sense. I've found, not found, but something I've been mauling over the last uh, probably maybe a year or so, the whole idea of work-life balance. I mean, you travel a lot for work, and so do I. Yeah. And, you know, I've had the, the same thing, you know, you, you kind of hope, you know, when you left the house on, on Monday morning, everything was good. And when you come back, um, you know, after traveling around the country, meeting with customers, working through problems and stuff, you know, when you get back, you know, Friday afternoon, like everything's going to be in the exact same shape when you left it. Um, and this is even true. <laughs> right, right, well, this right. is even true for, for a project. I mean, you know, I can leave a project on Friday, go home, come back on Monday and it's completely off the rails. And I'm like, we didn't do anything over the weekend. Like what actually changed? Um, so what I've been thinking more <laughs> of is that whole, the, the statement of work-life balance, because it assumes like you talked about in the categories that you put focus into is that they all have to be equal. And right, exactly. Yeah. I, I think that's where so many people get hung up on the point is that they try to equalize, which means they start counting hours or things of that nature, and they try to get everything right, you know, everything spread out proportionally. And that's just not I, I, I just it's it's an inter it's a good phrase, I guess, as long as you don't boil it down to the component parts to go, well, what is balance? You know, does it have to be balanced down to the minute? And um yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, you're not, you're not going to get it right, but going into it knowing, okay, I'm going to do everything I can, but even if it doesn't go right, that's okay, because I'm still going to do everything I can. That's right. Um, you know, you and I had a conversation a while back about Jesse Eisler, um, who, yeah. and, and David Grogan, and some of these guys, and, and I was, I had had a, um, uh, a tough day at work and I had a tough day at home and then I'm sitting here going, man, you know, can I, you know, like this is, this is next level, right? This is the, this is that internal narrative. And then, and then something pops in my head that, that, that I had screenshotted a long time ago and I kept, I kept with me and it's, and it's a quote from him that says, when you're trying to build something or be great, you're going to be out of bounds. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, at that point in time, that's what I needed to hear. You know what I mean? I needed to hear that it's okay to be out of balance because I was – remember when I said no one could be harder than me on myself? Mm-hmm. Well, if I'm creating this, this atmosphere of shame because I'm out of balance, that's doubling down, man. That's doubling mm-hmm. down on where you're at, you know, mentally. So when I see things, when I when – I, you know, when I remember things, when I see things that speak to me in that moment, I'm like, hey, this is what I needed. Then, I, then it, it brings me back to, uh, to where I need to be to continue moving forward. And that goes back to, you know, the, the, when the mentors actually say something out loud that I think, I'm like, oh, you got my attention. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, yeah, it resonates. That's one of the things where, where, you know, I've read all these business school books and then I go to business school and I, and I think it was one of the best investments I made because of what I got out of it. And, and there's other things that, that may seem cliche or seem politically correct. Look, I'm, I'm good with all that. I, I know all that. I'm, 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 I, I respect it, whatever. But when you really do something unconventional and, you know, you really get my attention because of the, insanity that's happening in my brain that I can't, you know, corral at this point in my life. I think I'll get better. But, you know, it's like that's what that's what I needed. That's what I'm talking about. How can I get more of that? Who does that? Where are these mm-hmm. people at? You know what I mean? And that's where, you know, where I try to pay attention. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to find those those tones that resonate with you and so you start you know they uh instead of uh you know being destructive they're more constructive and they kind of you know they help build you up in that moment yeah it's it's sometimes that's actually pretty hard to do is to be open you know keep your feelers out there to uh to be open to that kind of that constructive um message that may come to some from come from someone because you never know who's going to actually give it to you exactly being, you know, being not only self-aware, but aware, I mean, it's, I, I mean, it, it being around people, I mean, like yourself, you know, like when you, it's just being around like-minded people or being around people that you like how they communicate, you like their realness, you like their authenticity, right? Like, because we've all spent enough time and we're still have time we'll spend with people that 
we look up to or we think they're awesome or they've got all these credentials and it's like that's all good that's cool you know what i mean but you notice down downstream of, of people you know younger that, that mm-hmm. it matters sometimes because of social media but then other times they act like it doesn't matter but th- there's all these there's all this stigma right but but really genuinely being around people that add value being around people that that help you at whatever stage of life you're in is like man that's that's what you that's what i need and again to get away from that shame or that internal dialogue and, and flip it and make it useful and channel that energy man it's just uh it's the it's freaking awesome but but it's hard again like telling someone how to swim it's hard to even put some of this stuff into words some people yeah. will understand this some people will think it's awesome and some people will be like dude that guy what what do you say it's all woo woo (laughs) (laughs) well Garrett I have definitely appreciated this I want to be respectful of your time I know we had some uh, some hard stops that were coming up I definitely see a a round two to this discussion maybe in uh, six to nine months we can check in with each other and see how things are going but for for those that are listening out there in the ether um, and you would like to connect with Garrett. Garrett, how can people get in touch with you and, and reach out in the uh, the vast interwebs? Where can they find you? Matt, I mean, you know, my name is spelled G A R R E T, so just one T. Uh, most people accidentally put you know two T's on Garrett, but sim- simply you know Instagram and uh, and LinkedIn are the best best is where I am online. And then uh, yeah, that's that's the most simple way to connect with me but but matt i gotta say you know thank you for this opportunity i feel like you know and for everyone out there if they are listening or if they've gotten to this point of the podcast this is the first uh one i've ever done i'm very excited about it um i look forward to the future i i I mean i look forward to listening to it i look forward to hearing how useful or or, you know how how i can improve and and just in, in closing um Good to keep plowing through this. I look forward to the, the the future with us, and I hope that if one piece of anything I said helps anybody one of these days, man, uh, that's all I could hope for. So thank you, Matt, for the opportunity. No worries, man. I look forward to uh, talking with you. We'll connect uh, coming up at a conference we've got next week, and uh, definitely take care of yourself, man. We'll be in touch. Will do, man. Take care. Right, Cheers. Bye. That conversation with Garrett has got me fired up. I want to go out and definitely get after some stuff. I don't know if riding uh, riding a motorcycle is definitely what I'm going to go after, but uh, maybe a big wheel. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. They've got those big kid big wheels. Have you seen those where you can like drift with them? Anyways, so Garrett provided some really, really good information, some good nuggets. I hope you enjoyed it. If you found something in here that you want to pass along to a friend, please do. Um, just my whole intention of putting this podcast together was just getting great information from really, really good and unique people on their path of life and getting that out to the general public. So if you find something, definitely share it, push it out there. Um, that would just be awesome because that's really what I'm driving to do here. If you guys want to follow me, definitely please do. I am on Twitter and Instagram at the handle of Devitt Matt. And then you can also find me on LinkedIn. And from there, that's pretty much, uh, yeah, it's pretty much it. Those are the three places I am most active. So anyways, I definitely appreciate everybody's uh, comments. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. I hope you're getting much more out of it than I am because I know I'm getting a ton out of putting these together and talking with interesting people. So once again, remember everybody, growth happens between dawn and dusk. Thank mm-hmm. you.